let's take out our Bibles and learn together. What was the purpose for the Transfiguration? A very important event that bears to the reader much significance. We see that the Transfiguration conveys to the reader of the Gospels the divinity of Messiah. And that is something that we need to always remember why. If you do not believe that Yeshua, I'm speaking about Jesus of Nazareth, if you do not believe that he is divine, meaning that he is God, then you had not accepted the biblical Messiah. And therefore, you don't understand the gospel. And because you have not received the biblical Messiah and you have an incorrect understanding of the gospel, you have not been saved. So divinity of the Messiah is a necessary belief that one must receive if they're going to be redeemed, saved, and welcome into the kingdom of God. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Luke and chapter 9. The book of Luke and chapter 9. Now we're going to begin in verse 28 and there there is a number. A very important number. We're going to see that this event took place approximately eight days after Yeshua had spoken some words. Now, not exactly eight days, but the scripture uses a term which means approximately. And why is that? Well, the emphasis here is on the number eight. And eight is a number of newness. It is a number of redemption. It's a number that speaks about a characteristic of the kingdom of God. And therefore, whenever we encounter that number eight in the scriptures, not our address, not our phone number, but in the scriptures only, Usually, that number eight conveys something that's new and different and relating to the kingdom of God. In other words, the number eight is a redemptive number. And what we see here, the emphasis of this passage that deals with the transfiguration, we're going to see that glory plays a major role. And what happens? Well, the takeaway for us is this. It is through redemption that we can experience God's glory. Let me say that differently. It is only through the redemptive work of Messiah Yeshua that we can experience the glory of God, meaning being brought into his presence, being brought into the kingdom. I've shared with you several times that when we think of the kingdom of God, There is going to be a unique light in that kingdom, and that light is the glory of God. So, as I said, look with me to that passage of Scripture. We're going to look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning in verse 28, where we read, And it came about, and notice, there is a conjunction that shows a contrast here. Messiah is speaking about something new, something different. It is not simply a continuation, but it's something that is new for the reader. And he says here, but it came about after these words, and the implication is, after speaking these words, and then we read, approximately eight days. And what did he do? It says, and he took Peter and John and Yaakov, your Bible will probably say Jacob, And he went into, and the implication is went up into a mountain. And what did he do there? To pray. Now, prayer is a a action that relates to agreeing with God. Meaning this, one of the reasons why you and I pray is so that we change. Our prayer does not change God. God is perfect. His will is perfect, and therefore, God does not change. Remember the scripture? 
it says that he, speaking about Yeshua, the Son of God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. So our prayer brings change to us. And what we should pray for is that we change and that we are brought into submissiveness to God's will. And what we find here is the term mountain. Remember, the scripture says he went up to a mountain. And the point here is mountain shows rule. And we're going to see a connection between the rule of God and glory. When God rules, and let's make it personal, when God rules your life, you are going to be experiencing glory. You are going to be an instrument, a vessel of God that behaves in a way that manifests God's glory. We can say that differently, that manifests God's presence in a situation. So we want to obey God. We want to behave righteously so that God's presence comes into a situation. He works and God's glory is manifested. That is what you and I are called to do as his servants. And we become his servants because of his redemptive work on Passover when he was crucified in Jerusalem. So look again, it says here, after these eight days, he went up and he did something. He went up into a mountain on top of it and he prayed, verse 29. And it came about, and the implication is, in his prayer, as he was praying, it came about that the appearance of his face, and we have a word for different. Now, most Bibles, even though it is not a verb or a participle, but they'll translate it that way, and that's fine because this does indeed convey a difference, a change. His appearance was altered and here's what we need to see when we looked at Yeshua in the body what did people see they saw a man and let's get something right Yeshua Jesus of Nazareth is fully man he was when he walked in this world he was fully man a human being but in addition to this, and this is what this passage is going to reveal, and many passages like it throughout the New Covenant, and we find references to his divinity in the Old Testament as well. But this is going to speak of his divinity. We see on that mountain what took place, the appearance of his face, and we have a word different. It was altered. Also, his garments and we see here literally it's in the singular his garment his clothes what he was wearing were white and notice his garment was white and the next word has to do with shining or being radiant and we see that simply that he was transfigured his appearance was different and here on that mountain what is going to be emphasized is the glory of God. And here's the key. It was not that the glory of God simply came upon him, but the glory of God emitted from him. Meaning this, what we see is a scripture that shows that intrinsically, inherently, Yeshua, he is divine. It's not that he reflects the glory of God. And that's what Moses did when he came down from the mountain. Remember that his face had these rays coming from it. But that's because he was in the presence of God. Here, there's something very different. Messiah himself radiated this glory because he is divine. He is God. And that is the purpose of the transfiguration. Look again. At verse 30, our next verse, and behold, and we see two men. Now, again, a number appears. 
And frequently, the number two expresses two different opinions, two different understandings. And that's exactly what we're going to see here. There is the truth being presented, and that is he is the only begotten son of God. He is divine. He is God. Now, Peter is not going to understand that initially. And he's going to say something and offer to do something that shows that he has an incorrect grasp of this situation. But look again at verse 30. And behold, two men were, were speaking with him. So two men were speaking with him. These were Moses and Elijah. Now, Moses represents the law. And Eliahu or Elias, he represents the prophets. And when we speak of the law and the prophets, it's an idiom for the word of God. Now, the question that we should be asking ourselves is this. Why is it that it's these two men? There were numerous great men and great women in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. Why is it that it was Moses and Elijah because when we speak about them the law and the prophets what we're referring to is the word of God and here's what we should grasp from that that fact that it was Elijah and Moses that the word of God when we read it properly we understand its message to us the word of God all the word of God also speaks to the true identity of Yeshua Yes, he's fully man, but he is also fully God. And this is why the doctrine of the Trinity is so important and biblical. Doesn't matter if the word Trinity appears in the Bible or not. The truth of the Trinity does. So the ones who were there, these two men, were Moses and Elijah. And we see here that, that they appeared, and this is what's going to be emphasized, in glory now the point here is this the glory that is being spoken of is the glory that that emitted from yeshua that came from him the scripture is saying that yeshua in and of himself is the source of this glory so we read in the bible that moses and elijah threw the, the word of God, they understood that the glory of God emitted from Yeshua, pointed to that. And it says they were speaking, literally were speaking concerning his departure, which was about in fullness to take place. And notice, in fullness was about to be in Jerusalem. Now, the departure that they're speaking of here is a word for journey and the word out. So journey out. That's why we could say a departure. And what were they speaking of that was going to happen in, in Jerusalem? They were speaking about his death. His death as the Passover lamb. And through that Passover lamb experience, we remember that Passover is the festival of redemption what the scripture is saying once again is that it's through the redemptive work of yeshua being the son of god that's why his redemptive work is superior now let me just simply say redemption is an accounting word it's a transaction it is a purchase and that purchase can have physical implications but when the element that is that purchasing element is the very blood of the Son of God, it is going to produce a redemption that, as the writer of Hebrews says, is eternal. It is going to have eternal consequences, and that word eternal is a kingdom word, which means simply it is going to have a kingdom implication bringing those who are redeemed into the kingdom of God, whereby they will be in the presence of God, that is, in the glory of God. So they were speaking to him 
about his departure, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Verse 32. But Peter and the ones with him. Notice the scripture says they were, and this next word has to do, most Bibles will say heavy, but it's a word for deep. They were deep in sleep. Now, they were there with him. He took them up to this mountain. This was happening, but initially, they were deep in sleep. That purpose of telling the reader that is to show that these, and we're speaking about Peter, Yochanan, that is John, and Yaakov, Jacob, they weren't grasping initially what was going on here. But keep reading in the middle of verse 32. But, but having woken up, and this is a word, there's a prefix, which means thoroughly having woken up. It says, they saw his glory. And the two men that were, and this is standing with them, but it's interesting. In the Greek language, that phrase for standing means in the past, present, and in the future. What two men? Who were the ones standing with them? Elijah and Moses. And what it simply says is that there has been a connection between the Word of God, Scripture, and Yeshua himself. And it's not something that was new to that day, but there was always that connection between him and the Word of God. He is the living Word of God. So the Word of God in the past pointed to him, Today it points to him, and it will continue to point, him, point to him. This is the, the purpose of, at the end of verse 32, the use of the perfect tense. Verse 33. And it came about, about in their, their departure from him, Peter said to Yeshua, and he uses a different word, which means master or Lord. It's a term of great respect showing authority, that is, that Peter recognized Yeshua's authority. And what did Peter say? He says, good it is for us to be here. That's literally what it says. It's not a question. He says, good it is for us to be here. Why? Peter beheld something. He beheld Yeshua, Elijah, and Moses all together and what was the reason he says it's good for us to be here well notice middle of verse 33 where it says and we will make three booths or tabernacles now these are these huts that the children of israel dwelt in during their 40 years in the wilderness so he says we'll make for you three three booths one for you, meaning one for you, Yeshua, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then it says at the end, not knowing what he is saying. Now, why is that there? Well, Peter, he knew the greatness of Moses and the greatness of Elijah. And his words had this implication, that Yeshua was like Elijah, like Moses, a great leader, a great man that God used in a mighty way. Is that true? Well, Yeshua. And the purpose of the transfiguration is to show that he's much more than Elijah and Moses. And we'll see that as the word of God continues. Because it says in verse 34, but these things he was saying. So as he was saying these things, it's in the present. As he was saying these things, notice what happened. It came about a cloud. And this cloud represents God's presence. And that cloud that came about covered them. And notice, when that cloud covered them, it says, but they, meaning Peter and John and Jacob, they became afraid as they were entering into the cloud as that cloud was what's covering them overshadowing them 
they became greatly afraid of what was happening as they went into this cloud. Now, the point is this. He is the Redeemer, who? Yeshua. And his redemption, because of who he is and what he's going to do, he is going to bring those who rightly understand him and receive his work. He is going to bring them into the presence of God. But they need to understand the truth, and that's exactly what's going to be shared at this time. Look now to verse 35. And the voice that came about from the cloud is speaking. And what was that voice from the cloud saying? It was speaking, saying, this is my beloved son. And listen to this. Him here. There's an emphasis on that word him. Him is emphatic. So God is saying this one, Yeshua, not Moses, not Elijah. They're great men. God used them mightily. But when it comes to sonship and understand something, the fact that Yeshua is the son of God speaks to his divinity. I'm a human being because my father's a human being, and he's a human being because his grandf- his father, my grandfather, was a human being. So the Son of God speaks to his divinity. And when the Scripture says the Son of Man, it speaks to his hum- hum- humanity. So those things, the term Son, relates to the Son of Man, humanity, the Son of God, divinity. Look again at verse 35. And the voice that came about from the cloud is saying, this is my beloved son, him here. Meaning, this is the one that you obey. And Elijah and Moses' presence on that mountain as he was transfigured simply shows that the word of God confirms this reality. Now let's look at our last verse, verse 36. And in, and the next phrase is the completion. We could say when it came about that that the word was, was spoken, this voice came to a conclusion. It was not being said anything any longer from that cloud. Notice what it says. And Yeshua alone was found. Meaning at the end, Elijah and Moses, they weren't there. The one who remained was and is the Son of God. This one who is God's most beloved Son and only begotten Son. And this idea of begottenness speaks to his his character, meaning that he is of the same divinity of his Father. Simply, he is God. So when this voice came to a conclusion, Only Yeshua was found there before them. And it says, and these were quiet. And and none of these things, after their, their departure, none of these things, during those days, meaning what days? The days of Yeshua's ministry. So after the departure of this cloud, After this event came to an ending, Peter, James, or excuse me, John and Yaakov, they did not say anything during the next several days and period of time about this event. Now, this event was was not spoken of until after his resurrection. Why? Well, one of the biblical truths is this. The disciples, now they loved Yeshua. They served Yeshua. They were discipled by him, but they did not have a proper faith even when Yeshua laid down his life on that Passover. And the fact is seen that none of the disciples believed in the resurrection initially. What does that mean? None of the disciples went to the tomb on that first day of the week, on the third day, expecting the resurrection. They were a 
hopeless people because without belief in the resurrection, you don't have a biblical hope. So they were there locked up, fearful. But it was only after they came to believe in the resurrection. We see it was after that faith that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were changed. And here's the message. Until you believe in the resurrection of the Son of God, you have not been changed by a salvation experience. It is necessary that we believe not just in the death of Messiah, that he paid the price, but that God raised him from the dead. And we also need to understand his identity as the only begotten son of God the Father, for he is the son of God, meaning he is divine, he is God. Just like the scripture says prophetically, he is Emmanuel, God with us. And that term, Emmanuel, is uniquely connected to the virgin birth. And we see that the virginity of Mary at the time of Yeshua's conception also speaks to the fact that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that fact also points to his divinity. Notice again, it says here that, that after this event ended, the voice concluded, and after, after uh, the leaving of this place, in those days, they said nothing. They proclaimed nothing, uh, nor of the things that they saw. They were silent. And it was the resurrection of Messiah, understanding that, that gave them the proper understanding of this event, where they could begin to share boldly concerning his true identity. Yes, he is Messiah. Yes, he's Redeemer. Yes, he's our Savior. Yes, he's our teacher. But unless you know that he is the Son of God, the only divine Son of God, God among us, unless you understand that, you have not known who Yeshua truly is. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel.